Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Rock Island Auction Company. I'm taking a look at some of the guns that they are going to be selling in their upcoming uh, April of 2016 premiere auction. And I have here a Thompson gun. Now, yeah, I can hear you. You're saying that does not look like a Thompson gun. However, this is a Thompson T2. Um, the Thompson gun was a really expensive submachine gun. Uh, the US military and the British military adopted them at the beginning of the World War II, largely because there just weren't a whole lot of other options and they were kind of stuck. Uh, the British in particular paid a lot of money, an excruciating amount of money for Thompson guns, uh, especially early in the war. Now as the war progressed, the Thompson was simplified and simplified and simplified and, and the cost came down quite a lot, but even at the end it was a pretty darn expensive gun. Uh, to put this in context, at the beginning of the war, a Thompson gun would cost uh, like $168 and change. The US military was buying Browning 1919 belt-fed light machine guns or medium machine guns for $55. So more than triple the cost of a 1919, just to put it in perspective. Now as early as 1939, the US government was trying to find a replacement for the Thompson, some better option. And they tested a whole bunch of different guns. Uh, some did well, some did not so well. Uh, Thompson, of course, was aware of this. They were quite happy making a lot of money on, on their Thompson guns. However, they didn't want to lose their income. You know, if the, if the US government ditches the Thompson submachine gun and adopts some replacement, well, they wanted to make sure that replacement was also being made by Auto Ordnance, the company ma that made Thompsons. So, or the company that owned the rights to the Thompson. So the Thompson, the, the Auto Ordnance Company, submitted a potential replacement for the 1928 Thompson to the US military. This was submitted in 1942 and it is mechanically totally different from a standard Thompson gun. Uh, it's a tube receiver gun, it actually fires from a closed bolt, it's select fire based on a progressive trigger, so a, a short trigger pull would fire in single shot and a long, uh, you know, a full length trigger pull would fire in full auto. Um, it did use standard Thompson gun magazines. I've got a 20 rounder in it here. And uh, a really simple construction method. You can see there's two wing nuts on the bottom here and that's what holds this tube receiver into the stock. So it's fairly simple to disassemble. Now these were manufactured, only a handful of them. Uh, my understanding is five exist today, two of which are in private hands, the other three in museums. Uh, and they were made in both 9mm and 45 caliber. The, the US government simply wasn't interested in the gun in 9mm, never bothered to test it, but they did test the 45 caliber guns. And unlike some of the other US military testing, for example, the programs to develop the M1 Garand and the M1 Carbine, the, the program that replaced the Thompson gun wasn't a single test of a whole bunch of guns side by side. Instead, they were testing guns individually as they were submitted. So in fact, by the time they were testing this gun, they had already kind of, uh, they'd already finished testing the gun that would replace it, ultimately, as the M2 uh, submachine gun. However, we can go through what happened at the, the trials for these guns. Uh, they put several thousand rounds through the gun. Um, after 750 rounds, the trigger housing cracked. Now, I believe this is the actual gun that was in US testing. Um, unfortunately, I can't take it apart, so I can't show you that crack in the trigger housing. Um, but that was responsible for a number of malfunctions but not all of them. In total, in the test, uh, this gun had 60 different malfunctions, 37 of them were attributed to that cracked trigger housing. So the T2 Thompson actually did pretty well in most of the testing. Uh, it was subjected to a sand and a mud test and it passed both of those better than, well better than the M2 that would eventually be chosen instead of this gun. Uh, that's of course largely because the magazine seals up the bottom and it fires from a closed bolt so the ejection port's pretty well sealed up. There's not a lot of ingress area for things like mud and sand. Uh, when they did long range semi-automatic shooting with it at 100 yards, it, it was also better than the M2. It was a pretty darn accurate, effective gun. And again, I would ascribe that to the, the closed bolt nature. Open bolt semi-automatic semi guns, when you pull the trigger, the bolt has to jump forward this long distance. And it's really a, an acquired skill to shoot one of those accurately because you got a lot of uh, stuff moving around while you're trying to hold the, the gun on target before it fires. The problem for this gun came in the full auto testing. They brought the target into 50 yards and they were shooting bursts. 
And one of the big problems they had was because of this slanted butt plate, the gun tended to slide off the, shoot, off the shooter's shoulder, and they, they had trouble getting good, accurate groups on target as a result. Now, of course, it also had a lot of malfunctioning issues. Like I said, 60 problems, 37 of them attributed to this parts breakage, but then again, parts breaking isn't really an excuse that you want to use. Uh, you ought, oughtn't have parts break on a testing gun anyway in the first place. So ultimately, this gun was, was dropped from competition because of the full auto issues, um, the, the effectiveness in full auto, and because of the parts breakage. Really, this trigger mechanism, while it's kind of cool, uh, was too complex for the gun. So the gun that, was repl that replaced this has a kind of an interesting story to it as well. Uh, it was the M2 submachine gun developed by a guy named George Hyde and manufactured by the Inland Corporation. Uh, Hyde is not one of the better known uh, US gun designers, but he really has a lot of work to his credit and he ought to be better recognized than he really is. And of course, Inland is the same company that would make a whole bunch of M1 carbines. Now, weirdly, the, the M2 was in service only very, very briefly. Only about 500 of those were made. Uh, they had some issues getting them into production. And by the time they had started producing guns, they had actually gone through and developed the M3, which is the grease gun, which we're much more familiar with. So the grease gun replaced the M2 really before the M2 had a chance to ever be issued or used. Anyway. We want to focus on the Thompson prototype here, not the other guns. So why don't I bring the camera in and show you a couple of the details of this guy. All right, a couple features we can take a look at. Let's just start right where we are. The magazine release is this simple spring-loaded metal tab. I have a 20-round magazine in the gun because that's what it was tested with, so that's kind of the, the appropriate visual. Uh, this actually doesn't come with the gun. I pulled this out of a drawer so I could show you what it should look like here. Bolt handle uh, is actually a bit reminiscent of the Thompson. Very simple. Um, this is a tube receiver straight blowback mechanism. As I mentioned, it does fire from a closed bolt, so it doesn't lock open. Um, and it does not lo lock open on an empty magazine either. Now, the way that this works, it's hammer fired. Unfortunately, I, like I said, I can't take this apart to show you. However, um, there is an auto sear that trips at the very end of travel of the bolt. So if I fire a single round, and I only press the trigger a little way. Let's see. There we go. Now, when I cycle the bolt, I will have to release the trigger before I can fire a second time because it is semi-automatic. However, if I pull the trigger back all the way, now, when I cycle the bolt, there's an auto sear that will trip and drop the hammer when I get to right about here. There it is. And again until I release the trigger and then it closes without that click. So this is an interesting and kind of creative system. Unfortunately it's fairly complex. It probably would have been a bit expensive to make um, and it's probably uh, responsible for a lot of the malfunctions that the gun experienced in testing. I mentioned that this gun had trouble in testing because the butt plate would slide off the shooter's shoulder. You can really see here, this is a substantially angled butt plate. Why Auto Ordnance chose to use this design, I don't know. It seems like they really kind of handicapped themselves unnecessarily by not just having a straight vertical butt plate. The rear sight here has both a notch and an aperture option. Uh, I don't know exactly what the ranges were for those, but uh, you could take your pick. I think the aperture is probably the better solution. And it had a front sight, actually pretty reminiscent of the standard Thompson gun, stuck out there on the end of the barrel. I really get a kick out of the fact that they actually used wing nuts as, as an attachment method uh, to hold the stock to the tube receiver. I, I kind of have to believe that had they actually put this into production, had it been adopted, they would have come up with something that got in the way a little bit less. I can only imagine that slings and other web gear is going to be really kind of awkward with these things sticking out the bottom of the gun. But that's what they were using. And of course, here are our markings. Uh, Thompson submachine gun, T2, right there. Caliber 45, made by the Auto Ordnance Corporation of Bridgeport, Connecticut, US. Those are the only markings on this gun, by the way. Well, thanks for watching, guys. 
I hope you enjoyed the video. Like I said, there are only a handful of these ever made and, and only a smaller handful in private hands. So something we don't get a chance to take a look at very often. If you'd like to uh, add this to your own collection, um, I don't know if it would be too wise to shoot it with broken parts, but it is cool to have one of the guns that was actually used in Army testing. At any rate, if you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to Rock Island's catalog page on the gun. You can take a look at their pictures and their provenance and description. And uh, if you just can't live without it, place a bid online or come up here and participate live in the auction. Thanks for watching.